Hello, and welcome to this special event as part of Rain Taxi's Twin Cities Book Festival. I'm Eric Lorber, the director of Rain Taxi. We are a nonprofit organization that champions aesthetically adventurous literature. If you don't yet know much about us, I invite you to check out our website anytime after this event to learn more about our quarterly magazine of critical writing and all the other great programs we produce to help drive readers to where writing is going, including the other upcoming virtual and in-person events in this festival. Tonight's event, like most Rain Taxi events, is free to attend, but if you're able to pitch in a little something, please use the donate button at the bottom of your screen. Some funding for our festival comes from the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council and the Minnesota State Arts Board, thanks to legislative appropriations from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. But our most vital support comes from readers just like you. Whether you're a one-time giver or you'd like to become a member and stay in touch with us year round, we are grateful for your support. Don't forget there are other ways to participate on your screen tonight. You can use the chat and send your comments and observations. If you have a question, please put it in the ask a question box. We'll try to get to those. And best of all, you can buy the book. And tonight, if you purchase a copy of In Every Mirror She's Black, you'll get a fantastic signed book plate from our friends at Majors and Quinn Booksellers, a great independent store here in the Twin Cities. With this book in my hands, it's my great pleasure to welcome the authors to our virtual stage. Here at Rain Taxi, we love to sniff out the treasures among debut works, and In Every Mirror She's Black is without question an extraordinary first novel by an author with a rather unique background. Born in Nigeria, educated in the United States, based now in Sweden, Lola Akinmadi Okerstrom is as wide ranging in her artistic practice as she is in her geography. She's an acclaimed photographer and travel writer. Her work has appeared everywhere from the National Geographic to the BBC and has garnered many awards. Now she's a fiction writer earning numerous accolades as well. And among the fellow writers praising her novel is Disha Filia. Disha is the author of The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, one of the absolute best short story collections of the last year. I urge everyone to read it. And I'm so delighted that she can lead our conversation tonight. It's now my great pleasure to turn the screen over to Lola Akinmadi Akerstrom and Disha Filia. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Hey, Lola. <laughs> oh, I was want to tell everybody what I told you earlier, which is I have just been so excited for this conversation. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of the celebration of your beautiful book. Um, so congratulations, first Thank and foremost, you. on uh, this book baby uh, <laughs> that launched September 7th, which was also my birthday. Um, yes. So I could not forget your your, your <laughs> book birthday. Um, and, you know, just all of the praise that you've received and all that is to come, you know, congratulations is so Thank well you. deserved. Um, I'm honored to be here with you tonight and to have been an early reader of in every mirror she's black um as eric said it's your debut novel and um i was hooked from the title um and then the novel itself is is just beautifully written and complex and so for those who haven't had the pleasure yet of reading um 
in Every Mirror She's Black. It's the story of three women, um, Kemi, Brittany, and Muna, who are who come from Somalia in the U.S. Um, to Sweden, and they're all in search of a better for of uh, for a better life. I won't give away more spoilers than that because we want you to explore uh, and experience the richness of their stories as they unfold. Um, but I do want to talk to you tonight, Lola, about them and their stories and about what you. Um, have done in this novel from a craft perspective. I think that's really important. Um, I'm curious as a as a writer and for those in the audience who are writers as well, and just for the reading public to understand um, and get a glimpse into how books are made and specifically how this wonderful book was made. So I want to get into all of that. Um, but let's start by how has it been since launch? What have you been hearing from readers? Oh my goodness. First of all, thank you so much, Disha. Oh. I mean, just your amazing blurb is <laughs> on the cover of the book. I mean, I'm totally fangirling. So thank oh. you for just being an early supporter of the journey of this book. Mm -hmm. And since launching on you know September 7th, it's been incredible, the support because the journey to publication was a rough one. And I think we'll get into that you know, yeah. later, but um, to see this in people's hands and hearing the early feedback from the mm -hmm. audience, from the readers, when a lot of publishers said there wasn't gonna be an audience for this book, mm. has been really you know, humbling. And so mm -hmm. I'm just grateful. I'm just swimming in the bowl of gratitude right now. That's yes. for sure. So yes. as writers, you know, we become something of experts on rejection. Yes. Um, it's part of the, the fabric of our lives as writers. Um, how, you know, let's just start there. Yes. How did you persevere through that rejection? Because the thing is, I tell people all the time, you only need one yes. Yes. Right? But it's yes. like, how do you keep going through all of those no's to get to that yes? So with every, you know, in every mirror, she's black, you know, it was the book I was meant to write at this stage of my life, right? Okay. I've always, before kind of getting here, I used to write creative nonfiction. That's my mm -hmm. background as a travel writer. Mm -hmm. And before that, growing up in Nigeria, I used to write fiction. And so I struggled to get back to fiction because I wasn't connecting to the right, to the kind of characters I wrote as a teenager, okay. as an adult, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was after kind of being on holiday and then reading, finishing Americana, I realized mm -hmm. the stories I needed to write was much closer to me. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of experience kind of traveling, living in different cultures, navigating the world as a black woman in mm -hmm. different spaces. And so I knew that the book I needed to write was much closer and I needed to keep it honest and real. And that was kind of the beginning of the journey of the rejection, <laughs> you know, okay. because when I crafted Kemi, Brittany and Mona, I wanted to show, first of all, that black women, there isn't any kind of one black culture. You know, black women mm -hmm. are not monoliths. They That's have right. different, you know, experiences, different privileges, different mm -hmm. wants, desires, you know, needs. That's why I really love secret lives. <laughs> you know, that's a big fan. Thank but you. Know, all, you know, all of that. And, and I wanted to write it based in Sweden because one, I live in Sweden, but also, mm -hmm. Uh, Sweden is a lot more multidimensional than we know. You know, mm -hmm. like we always have this kind of one dimensional image of Sweden. Sure. And so I needed to craft that. And so when I wrote the book and we it was time to actually find the right publisher, mm -hmm. we got over 70 rejections for this book. And wow. yes, and it was a rough journey because one, the book doesn't fit in a category. Mm -hmm. So it's too literary for commercial and too commercial for literary. Yes. So it sits in the middle and then it centers black women mm -hmm. in a very kind of mainstream, you know, uh, way, which mm -hmm. a lot of the editors were saying their audiences couldn't connect with, you know, and mm -hmm. it's the same audience that likes vampires and web, like connects easily, you know. With but those you can't imagine of, black women. No, <laughs> you know? no. So, <laughs> so, so that one. Executive. Yeah. So that one, that one was painful to hear. Like, oh, yeah. so I, so people can connect to me just because of the color of my skin, but right. can connect to uh, something else. So that was a painful journey, just getting all those rejections. And I knew, especially as a writer, it can get you down because you think yeah. it's an indictment of your craft, but it's not because right. I write in other, you know, mm -hmm. in other um, industries. So mm -hmm. 
yeah, so just uh, wanted to wrap that and, and bring it back to you. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think because we experience so much rejection as writers, when we get that deal, when we get that yes, it can be tempting to, you know, kind of go with the flow. Um, but, you know, your book remains, you know, it keeps the Black women centered. And we yes. know that doesn't always happen. And I was worried about that with my book. It's like, are they going to make try and make me make this less Black, you know, somehow yes. or have some sort of, you know, gaze that I didn't yes. want there. Um, and so I think it's also good for emerging writers to hear that, you know, this, you wanted intentionally a book that centered Black women. Um, yes. Did you have to deal with any resistance? I mean, other than the rejection, like once you got uh, a yes, yes, you know, how was no. it after that? And and that's why I love you know, source books, you know, my, mm -hmm. my publisher, they didn't, they, they heard my voice, right? Mm -hmm. So they heard my voice and that's why they said yes, because they knew that I had something to say. Mm -hmm. And just the editorial process was a dream because right. it was just more polishing. There was no, they, they didn't make me change the essence yeah. of what I was trying to say, you know, and a lot of people felt like, okay, why did I have Yoni as a character, right? Mm -hmm. Well, black women don't move to Sweden for no reason, right? It's not Spain. It's not Portugal. It's not Italy. Mm -hmm. It's not somewhere where we just pick up and say, Oh, this feels, um, the reason we move to Sweden is either most of, usually you meet a man, mm -hmm. you know, or, you know, maybe you get transferred for work or maybe you come in as a refugee. Those are kind of the main reasons. Mm -hmm. And then the rest, maybe school exchange program. So to not have Yoni, as yeah. a character, even though I didn't send time at all, right. wouldn't have made it realistic. Like the women right. wouldn't have just moved for no, you know, kind of right. a reason there. So I'm really grateful that, you know, the editorial process just kind of cleaned up, you know, you mm -hmm. know how it is, mm -hmm. uh, take out the, uh, the fluff and just make it tighter. Yes. And yeah. So, well, I'm glad that you had that experience. <laughs> um, so let's talk about, how the concept came to you. I mean, you, you talked how you wanted to write something closer to your own life and that was a pivotal moment. Did it come to you sort of as the story of three people because of the three ways that people, you know, women end up, black women end up in Sweden or was there one of the women's story that emerged first? So it actually all came at the same time because okay. I knew I wanted to tackle three things. I wanted to tackle class career and culture. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to bring three different women to also show that um, it's not also a pain or struggle Olympics. Just because yeah. somebody is struggling in a privileged bubble doesn't mean, ah, you know, struggles are not valid. Right. And so I wanted to put that, you know, all three of them side by side mm -hmm. to show that, you know, even through your struggles, there's still some privilege you know, based on maybe background or work or access. And so they all kind of came together. Mm -hmm. And then I knew that at that point, I also needed to create something that would bring them, you know, to right. Sweden as well. So sure. that's, so they all kind of came at the same time. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about this, you know, um, magic that you <laughs> worked to write <laughs> all three of them. They've got their own histories and personalities and challenges. Um, and then you wrote them all so truthfully. So what, um, you know, how did you wrangle that? Yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, when I first started writing the book, I wanted to go literary fiction, right? I wanted okay. to like really, and then I, then I stopped and I said, why do I want to hide what I want to say behind kind of mm -hmm. really super flowery prose so that it yeah. lands easier? Let mm -hmm. me just make it clear, direct. I wanted to make it super accessible yes. because in my life as a travel writer, that's what I do. I try to bridge like cultural kind of connection mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and make things easier to just more accessible. And so for me, I wanted to write the book that way. Mm -hmm. And, and so that's kind of how I started crafting, you know, the women and then I've experienced a lot of things. So all of the women are not me, but they are also me. Yeah. In the sense that, you know, I recognize all their struggles. Mm -hmm. I've also met many people. They are inspired by, by, it's like every woman is a collection of lots of experiences of people. Yes. Of, and so that was what I wanted to create. That even Muna, uh, 
it like feels like my younger self, like a teenage version of myself when I first moved to the US, when I back battled the isolation and loneliness and mm -hmm. trying to find belonging. And so all of those women are kind of rooted in reality because those are things that people either have experienced or people have experienced. So, mm -hmm. you know, as a black woman, you recognize, as a woman of color, you recognize. Mm -hmm. I get that. Um... And so you drew on your some of your experiences and those of other women. Where did you, um, or if you, did you do a lot of research? And I know as a travel writer, you know, uh, there's probably a lot that you just knew, but what role did research play in writing the story? So, so before I actually wrote this book, I actually have another book called Logum, which is a deep dive into the Swedish mindset. And that okay. book, is like nonfiction, it really goes beneath the culture. So in a sense, I did a lot of research, spent, and I mean, I, I speak Swedish, I'm mm -hmm. you know, integrated into the culture, but writing that book was needed for me to also write this book mm -hmm. because that book talks objectively about this is how it feels like in society. And then I'm like, you know what, how about I write fiction that shows this in progress, yes. that shows, this in, in a way that people will, will understand. And then in terms of, uh, you know, like Muna's situation and the mm -hmm. asylum center, that's based on a real asylum center. Mm -hmm. I spent two to three years visiting as a photographer. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time with the refugees there doing a photo project mm -hmm. just, and that photo project was mostly for them. It wasn't something I exhibited or it was just to, so, a lot of the, you know, some of those situations, again, researching, you know, um, mm -hmm. Yoni's condition, make, you know, making sure I got that. And yeah, so a lot of research went in, but also uh, a lot of observation of living in the culture of knowing, of seeing, of living it every day. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask another process question uh, yes. for our fellow writers. Do you have a set schedule or, um, you know, for your writing and um, do you outline? That's always a question I get is, do, do you outline? Correct. So with this particular book, I outlined just the characters, like the characters mm -hmm. and different situations mm -hmm. because, you know, I was trying to remember, oh, I remember something similar that might have happened. How can I tweak this? You know, mm -hmm. even though it's not, again, Kemi is not me, people. Just, I just want to put that, you know. I know you always but, uh, want to say that. I, know, I always keep saying that. You know, people are keep coming, are you Kemi? No. No, but, um, you know, outlining the characters and different, just kind of brainstorming down mm -hmm. because the actual writing of the book took four months, but mm -hmm. it took mm -hmm. five months to actually almost like brain dump everything yes. I had experienced and stuff like that. So I don't know how the future books will be in terms of process, but I know with this one, because I really wanted to make the characters different and unique, I needed mm -hmm. to um, bring them them first before mm -hmm. writing them, like picking scenes and then stitching, you know. Yeah, I love that. That's, I love, cause my process is that too. I call it haphazard. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Lots of pieces that you put together almost like a puzzle and then yes. you polish it up. Yes. Um, and let's see, did you write this book with a particular audience in mind? And if so, who was that audience? I wrote it for both Black audiences and non-Black audiences. Mm -hmm. I wanted Black audiences to, first of all, see themselves mm -hmm. in it as just, yeah. yes, we have different desires. We're tired of carrying the weight of the black community on our shoulders. We want to make mistakes. Eck, we want luxury too. Like we want, yeah. you know, we want the same things. And then I also wrote it for a non-black audience. So it's easier for them to step in the shoes mm -hmm. and see and understand. Yes. Um, so that was kind of how I wrote it. It's like, I know it's weird to say oh, I wrote it for everyone, but I wrote it in an accessible way so mm -hmm. that both audiences, both black can say yes. And then non-black can say, oh, wow. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. You know, and that's why I did not make it literary fiction. I made it really, mm -hmm. you know, uh, kind of um, clean, more contemporary, more upmarket fiction, direct, you know, uh, prose. So, mm -hmm. And, you know, those distinctions, you know, they don't. Yes. 
you know, who do they serve, right? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but you know, but but that's, I mean, that's the industry, right? And that's right. also why I got a lot of news because mm -hmm. um, as a black African writer in the diaspora, mm -hmm. I was already supposed to be writing a certain way. And so they didn't right. want to take me seriously. They're like, well, mm -hmm. this is not, you know, the way, you know, you're not writing about, you know, mango trees in the village. Like we right. don't want this, you know? And I'm like, right. no, they need to be, more space. I mean, yeah. there's a proverb in my language, Yoruba, that says the sky is big enough for all birds to fly. There should be yes. space for yes. us. There should be space for lots of different kinds of voices of stories, you know, that just sh shares how, you know, multi-faceted we are, you know, so wanted to. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, was there anything you were worried about with this book in terms of either as you were writing it or um, after the fact, when you were done, worrying about the, or concerned about the reception of it? Um, I, won't, I won't say wor worried because, well, I would say this, that, um, you know, there was a Swedish publisher that was interested mm -hmm. in publishing it, but they wanted me to cut a lot of things out. And I said, no, that um, I didn't go through 70 rejections for my book to come die on your desk. Ooh, you know, and okay. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true yes. because because what you're saying is your lived experiences make me uncomfortable. So I need you to edit it out. Mm -hmm. And and so I'm not so much worried because it's true. Right. Mm -hmm. And and that's the thing I also wanted to share. I'm a travel writer. I love Sweden. It's my new home. I write about Sweden in many ways for mm -hmm. National Geographic, for different magazines but i'm also a black woman in sweden so for me to keep pushing just one dimension yeah doesn't make sense right. i have to write the full broad spectrum i can love you one day and criticize you the other day that's marriage you know yes i'm married, you know, I'm married to you know i'm married to to, yes. to sweden. and and i think that's what people all here also need to understand mm -hmm. is that we need to be able to understand to show that we're also vulnerable yeah. you know that it's not just this perfect country of the nordics of the north mm -hmm. things are not always perfect and that's okay to show that side to the world you know and so for yeah. me i needed to write this because one i'm a black woman living here you know mm -hmm. and meeting those refugees i cannot keep writing about just the beautiful aspects everybody yeah. come visit it's a lovely country I can just keep writing about that without actually also sharing other marginalized voices as well. For me, right. I'm all about depth, you know. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and in doing so, you know, you're giving permission to so many other writers who get those, you know, false messages that they have to write a certain way or they can, you know, only write certain um, narratives, the usual narratives, you yes. know. But you have written this kind of disruptive narrative, and I feel like I'm hoping that it will encourage other Black women to do more of that. We need more of that. I hope um, so too. I really do. <laughs> and even if they have worries and fears, push past those yes. and you know write what they want to write. Yes. Um, do you feel like you're a different writer or a different person as a result of having written this book? How did it change you? Um. I think it was more going back to my roots, right? Mm -hmm. So um, ever before I got into travel writing or into creative nonfiction, I wrote fiction when from my preteens in and up in, you know, from my teens. And I was growing up in Nigeria and went mm -hmm. to boarding school there. And I had my own little mini library where I actually had, <laughs> had a <laughs> sign out sheet because oh. I hand wrote everything. And so my friends would come in and check out, you know, and return mm -hmm. my stories. And so, um, what the, writing this book has done is reconnected me to that first love of fiction yeah. and saying that even though now your voice has matured over the years through other forms of writing, now it's okay to go back to that first love yeah. and see maybe, you know, new packs fly, you know, again, you know, um, mm -hmm. for lack of a better word. So with every writing process, you do you you gain new insights. You know you mm -hmm. you learn more, especially if you're doing research. But I think for me, it's more reawakening that first love mm -hmm. that has always been there, that been lying dormant for a while. 
And a lot of times we were more courageous then, you know? Yes, yes <laughs> so, exactly. We've come back, you know. Yes. And yes. the value, I'm just thinking, of, you know, I can picture you with your personal, you know, library and people checking it out. You were saying <laughs> as a teenager, this work is valuable. Yeah, this, yeah. You know? <laughs> but, but they also said that I was somebody who knew my voice early on, yes. right? Yes. And, and that's one thing that I always say is, and I'm grateful that I knew kind of, who I was, even though over the years you grow, you evolve, mm -hmm. you get better, you learn. But I've always had my distinct voice as a person, even through mm -hmm. all my career. You know, mm -hmm. even I've always known what my kind of purpose was. And so it's uh, so over the years, it's more just refining that, growing into that, fully stepping into that. Even when, mm -hmm. you know, maybe when you're younger, you're scared, you're, yeah. you're always sidelined because you feel like you're different or you don't fit into a box. But mm -hmm. now, I'm glad I never fit into those boxes. I just kind of yeah. stay true to my weird self. So yes, <laughs> here's to weird. Cheers. Yes. <laughs> um, do you have? A, I know this is sort of like asking if you have a favorite child. Do you have a mm. fa favorite character or storyline from the book? Uh, I mean, all the characters are all just messy and complex. Yes. But there is one character that I had a lot of fun crafting and creating. Okay. And is a Turkish business owner named Yagis. Yeah. And he's <laughs> I wanted to dislike him so much and then know, he right? didn't let me. <laughs> he's the kind of person that you just because I feel like everybody knows a Yagis. He's one of these yes. politically incorrect guys. He's a on the one hand, he's very hardworking. He's kind of this hardworking immigrant that comes in, you know, small business owner. On the other hand, he's like everything that's against feminism and like yes. it's just it's just yes. a complicated messy character is not good is not bad it's just somewhere in the mucky middle mm -hmm. which is what most people are right yeah and so yes. for to create yagis i think that was one of my just personal favorite characters to create and is kind of weird relationship with mona like yes. taking oh. care of her in a weird way as a younger sister but still get out of my sight, I'm done with you, you know? So it's like a weird kind of, uh, yeah. Yeah, so. and then um, Mona has to accept his relationship with her yes. roommate. Roommate. And, and messy, right? Like you said. It is messy. messy. It I is was messy. all in my feelings about that. I know, it, it is messy. <laughs> and I know I'm not going to give anything away, but it's also showing because a lot of that relationship with the roommate, people feel like, was he doing something aggressive to her? But it's like, no, she was just enjoying herself, you know? But And yeah. when you read it through that lens, you know, yeah. then people are like, oh, Mona is innocent. She doesn't know things. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And it so. revealed, you know, you use that situation to re reveal and amplify what we, you know, yeah. um, Mona. But yes, it... it, it um, yeah. More it desires and different things that people... Like, yes. you know, so. I could not put him in a box like I wanted. No. <laughs> um, what was there a particular character or scene or chapter that was challenging to to write, either from a personal perspective or from a craft perspective? Um, let's see. So I I won't say a particular chapter, but I think uh, Brittany was a very challenging character for me to write. Because mm -hmm. Britney's story is also valid. Like when mm -hmm. I get a lot of feedback, Britney is the one woman that a lot of, you know, people want to kind of slap and say, get, you know, get your get your shit together, yeah. girl. You know, <laughs> you know, you know, you're stronger <clears throat> than that. But I wanted to create a character that was also valid that says, you know what, she doesn't have to be the kind of fit into the stereotypical what a black woman needs to be doing. You know, she doesn't right. have to like she wants to thrive. Maybe the way she, her uh, values for thriving are different from what I will choose, but mm -hmm. it's valid for her, you know? And so she mm -hmm. was a character that I needed to, that was challenging because I also wanted to make her empathetic or you, people yeah. at least see that she's, she doesn't know what she wants and she feels mm -hmm. like by grabbing onto ultimate privilege that will give her what she wants, you know? So mm -hmm. she was a, a, a character that, I, that, because she was just so different, but I needed to, uh, bring a voice into this because she's very valid. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a bit about um, 
what you, who and what you're reading right now if you have any time i know that yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, absolutely uh so uh two books i'm currently reading uh black girls must die exhausted by jane allen okay i'm gonna be chatting with her soon you know okay. so um, i'm digging that and then um i'm reading a proof of uh, yinka where's your husband that's coming out next year by lizzie okay. blackburn and just and a, and a book I recently read uh, was called Wahala, which is also coming out next year, kind of early proofs. And reading those books was just so refreshing, right? Because they also center Black women, but it's more contemporary, more following, like it's outside of the box, you know, of, of just that. showing the range mm -hmm. of Black women and our experiences and our desires. And, and I think for me, reading you know, Secret Lives earlier this year almost set the tone, you know, Aww. of, no, and, and, I, and I'm saying that, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm a big fan, fan of yours is when I read it, you know, I immediately, I messaged you like, oh my God, you know, that, you know, for one, I need my edges back, but also that. <laughs> you have a whole collection of edges. Right? Exactly, <laughs> right. But, but also, you know, that it was saying, yes, that mm -hmm. we have desires, we have wants, we have, um, you know, different things and we're not monoliths, you know, and yes. we're valid as well, you know, and so that, I think, setting that tone and then seeing all these new books kind of coming out, just amplifying the broad experience of Black womanhood, is just, it, it warms my heart. So lots of great yeah. books coming out. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, was there, uh, you know, writers have different rituals when they're mm -hmm. writing and some will say, you know, if I'm writing fiction, I can't read any fiction or I can't mm -hmm. read anything else. Were you reading actively as you were writing? Um, not really. I mean, I think because I also do other things, you know, yeah. so, and, and I am a creative person in other, you know, I, I'm a photographer, I'm a writer, I do other things. I uh, paint once in a while. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think it's more when I have writer's block, I mm -hmm. actually don't push through writer's block. And I'm, yeah. and I'm grateful in that way mm -hmm. that if it's not coming, I don't force it. I just switch to a different creative outlet mm -hmm. so that, that, so I let the writing part rest and mm -hmm. refresh so mm -hmm. that when I come back, then it, it, it just comes back uh, new. So if I'm struggling to write, I don't push it. I just maybe switch to photography because maybe that's what my brain is trying to use to communicate creatively at this time. That moment, yes. At that moment, you know, then, you know, switch to something else, switch to talking, switch to teaching, just switch mm -hmm. and then give my writing, you know, cells a break to refresh yeah. and come back renewed. So that's how I deal with my own writer's block. And you mentioned doing other uh, projects. Can you tell us a bit about what other projects you're working on? <laughs> something we might be seeing in the near future? Well, I mean, you know, there's always, you know, once you write a book, then there's, mm -hmm. where's, where's the second one, right? Yes. So that's, you know, that's <laughs> been, uh, been um, it's in the works, you know, as well mm -hmm. as two other ideas, you know, that mm -hmm. I'm outlining and, and we'll see because, you know, uh, it may follow some of the characters. It may not. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see what's going on there. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, there's just a lot of things going on. And yeah, that's busy, busy woman. <laughs> and uh, let's see, before we shift to um, giving the audience a chance to ask some questions, um, can you talk a bit about your literary influences? Mm. And who those may be. Yes. So, I mean, we always say there are so many, right? I mean, okay. I draw inspiration from so many different kinds of writers. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say this. When I was a teenager, I came across D.H. Lawrence's work, right? Mm -hmm. Many years ago. And the reason why D.H. Lawrence still is in the back of my mind, well, for one, probably at that time in my life, it made a big impression. Right. Mm -hmm. But also, it's the way, the dramatic way he writes, right? Mm -hmm. or, you know, his work is where he can describe tension between two people across four, four pages, and the people yeah. are just sitting in the room not talking to each other, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and just short mm -hmm. kind of precise sentences. So 
Um, even though I, you know, there's so many authors I, I love, I mean, you included, you know, I really like Chimamanda's work. I, I, there are just many people. Um, but uh, D.H. Lawrence and that mm -hmm. style of dramatic writing, mm -hmm. I actually see in a lot of my creative nonfiction when I write narrative travel writing, where it's the, mm -hmm. and, and I think that also, me being a travel writer also helped with me writing fiction. This book, because this book, it feels like it's just, it doesn't stop. It just goes, 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 mm -hmm. goes, goes, mm -hmm. because you have to maintain the energy. Yes. And as a travel writer, you have maybe 1,000 words to maintain an energy, capture the audience and bring them through to the end mm -hmm. for a magazine or for a... And when I was writing this book, I was writing it as if I was writing an article. So I needed to keep the beginning and then the transitions and then that make sure right. that I keep... <laughs> so, so right. yeah, so it's like, it just goes, goes, goes. And people are like, what? I want to sleep. What's... And now I have to turn the next page, you know? So it's... <laughs> And so I think in a sense, my years as a travel writer or, you know, you know, capturing a sense of place or being descriptive or mm -hmm. really truly helped me in writing this fiction because I brought a lot of that drama and sense of place into it. Mm -hmm. And that's why when it found a publishing home, they polished because they <laughs> did all of that, that yes. tightening. And, um, and as a reader, I just thank you for that because yeah, the story really was gripping and there were not any lulls, you know, like you said, you <laughs> did not let up. And, yes. um, and I had a lot of raised eyebrows. So. <laughs> exactly. Questionable things. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> like, so, but I so appreciate um, mm -hmm. you bringing the stories of these three black women together and that you, um, you know, they stayed centered and showed just the range of, you know, who we are and can be. And as always, the messiness. Thank you. Yes, <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you. So I guess now we can bring Eric back who will connect us with the audience um, to take some audience questions. Oh, I'd be delighted. But first, thank you both so much. What an exhilarating conversation. It's fantastic to hear kindred writers dig into the craft of their books. Um, and I want to remind our readers, don't forget, you can purchase In Every Mirror, She's Black. You get a great signed book plate with it sent all the way from Sweden. So, uh, so I hope uh, everyone will do that. And uh, I think some of our questions are... are uh, uh, based on some of the questions Disha's already asked or wanting to hear a little bit more about some of those uh, tendrils. Uh, one being uh, this fascinating anecdote about D.H. Lawrence. I'm not sure how young you were when you read that, uh, but someone is curious what other books, and especially younger, what books as a young child uh, or literature or uh, the Yoruba tradition, the folk tradition, what what were you exposed to that you really feel got into your DNA? Yeah. Well, uh, so talking about the D.H. Lawrence, it was probably around 16, 17. I was already in college then. So it wasn't like I was 13 flipping through Lady Chatley's Lover. No. Uh, <laughs> but um, being Yoruba, right, uh, I have a strong tradition culture and it's a culture of metaphors. So it's a culture of metaphors. We use a lot of metaphors in our writing and the way we speak, in the way we compare. And so, you know, I shared a quote about, you know, the sky is big enough for all birds, you know. So a lot of that metaphor I bring as well into my work because that I am root, that's my culture, like my, my base culture. So I bring a lot of that metaphorical way of writing, of conversing or of describing into, into my work as well. So that is like those that follow even my travel writing or, or my other kind of uh, non-fiction will see that, a lot of that. And with my previous book, when I wrote it, I really went digging for a lot of Swe Swedish proverbs as well. And one of the Swedish prover proverbs I found was, the deepest well can also be drained. And that, when I found that uh, uh, proverb, it also inspired some of the stories in this book that, oh my God, that is such a powerful phrase, especially as black women, we are some of the deepest wells in society for all the things we've had to go through, still go through. And one day, you know, we, we, we are, we're human too, you know? So, and so that is, um, yeah. 
So that's what I wanted to share. Oh, that's wonderful. And actually uh, quite predictive also of another question asking um, a little bit more about your, because Nigerian fiction has such a rich lineage and yes. uh, to step into that stream is, is, uh, is to inherit some of it and also to push back as you spoke about earlier. Yes. Um, and uh, and and you've drawn yet another another great vein out of that. Um, you spoke about so so we've spoken about Nigeria and about Sweden. Yeah. What about the United States? Was your time in the U.S. Uh, did something? Uh, I mean, obviously, it was your college years uh, among yes. them. So uh, everyone's immersed at that time in, in learning all sorts of new things. But is there anything um, from the US that that uh, persists in your writing? Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, I consider myself Nigerian American, even though I wasn't born in the US, because after many years in the US, I feel like I've adopted a lot of the ideals as well as some of the values. And so I actually connect, you know, with the US very much. But what I want, what I brought, from the US to with me to Sweden is that there's actually also privilege in being African American in Europe versus me just being an African in Europe. And that's what I also wanted to show in the book through Britney's character is that there are levels, right? There's a there's still privilege tied to your passport or tied to where you're coming from. And so in Sweden, if you come, if you're an African American, you still have a bit more privilege than maybe if I, you know, I said, oh, I'm Nigerian or I'm a refugee, because they're tying you back to that American values, you know. And so I kind of brought some of that, not in, not necessarily into my personal life. You know, I'm Yoruba, I'm Nigerian, and uh, also, you know, have some American values. But I brought it into the book to show that there's also privilege in that. And I think there's some scenes in the book where people are asking, you know, can me, like, why did you leave America? Because in America, you can be like Oprah Winfrey, right? Uh, in Europe, not so much. It's it's not there yet, even though they try to say they're there. It's not. So. Right. Yes. And uh, thank you for that wonderful answer, because uh, something that just st struck me about so much about this book is how deftly it it really interrogates all of the isms, uh, racism, sexism, and, and nationalism also uh, in, in so many ways. Um, uh, Disha asked you to hint at what you're working on and uh, someone chimed in to say they can't wait for the sequel. So yes. <laughs> just to let you know, that's the reaction. Uh, yes. But they're also asking, and this is kind of fascinating from the point of view of, of craft, um, is there anything that, that you would change about the characters? Is there anything about who they are, how they end up, or, you know, is, uh, I'm sure there's a journey living with these people that you create, um, and then sometimes maybe they get away from you, or you wish they were different. Mm. Well, I'm definitely working on stuff, <laughs> you know, that will hopefully maybe uh, potentially close some holes. No, but um, I won't change anything from the characters because they were created, crafted intentionally that way, that way to be, um, you, you know, I was reading something recently where somebody was frustrated. She's like, well, this is a non-Black woman saying, well, I couldn't connect with Kemi and Britney, but I could connect with Mona. And what she was saying is that I could connect with the vision of a Black woman always suffering, but a Black woman that's trying to thrive or trying to kind of find love or do something else while still having some privilege I cannot connect to. That told me a lot. That told me a lot because that was also part of why this book was getting rejected, right? Because uh, oh, I saw somebody else uh, recently said something about, oh, well, what's Britney complaining about? She's in luxury, right? What does she, you know? And so I'm not gonna change anything about the characters because Black women are tired of surviving. We're allowed to thrive. And it feels like a Black woman that's thriving seems to be the most threatening <laughs> thing in society because society has said our 
lives are defined by struggle, constant struggle. So those are kind of the topics I am kind of interrogating and I'm going to be writing a lot more of, and especially in Europe, because in Europe, uh, it, it's, it's one of those places where it says, well, racism happens somewhere else, you know, at least in Europe, it's more integrated or especially with interracial relationships in Europe. Well, there's a lot more here, it's different, yeah. But it's one thing marrying or sleeping with a black woman in Europe, it's another thing listening to her as your CEO in Europe. They're not there yet, they're not there yet. So, so it's, there's a lot of things and themes <laughs> that I could keep exploring forever in fiction. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> so. Good, good. I think all of us want you to keep exploring. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. And, and <laughs> you should chime in on this too, because I was, I was telling someone uh, here that uh, uh, reading your book actually mm -hmm. led me to Lola's book, and mm -hmm. and and how, and I was. Ex uh, Telling them about what I saw as some connections, they asked, "Oh, it's, it sounds great. Is there a is there a movement of fiction that centers black women's lives?" And I thought, "Well, that, that'd be great, right?" But what do you what do you think? Is there a movement? I hope so. I mean, well, we've always been here, right? Yes. <laughs> you yes. know, and and it's just a matter of whose stories get told. Um, yes. I have to think how many Lolas didn't keep going after seventy rejections. Right. So we, you know, just think how many people are writing these stories um, that center us and don't get an agent, much less, you know, get to the point of, 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 of a, a, a publishing house seeing the work to even reject it. So the stories are there. Um, the writers are there. Um, I think about what Toni Morrison said uh, in response to Ralph Ellison's book, um, Invisible Man. She said, invisible to whom, mm. right? We're not yes. invisible to each other, no. you know, um, we're there. And so what I'm hoping is uh, if, if, if rather than say it's a movement uh, in terms of the, the artistry, because the art has been there, that it's a movement of people in power in publishing um, stop rejecting in every, you know, a mirror she's black, you know, when, when a book like that comes across their desk, that they um, start imagining an audience that's bigger than the one in front of their nose, you know, um, and then putting, um, putting the money behind that. So, you know, paying the authors, paying for marketing and promotion, that's another reason why you don't see a lot of these books because you can get a book published and then no one, you know, it doesn't get the kind of um, exposure that um, my book and that Lola's book um, have fortunately gotten. Um, that should be uh, a given, you know? Yes. So that's the movement I want to see. Mm. And I do want to add one thing because, you know, Disha's book has won so many awards and there have been a lot of black writers winning and sweeping awards and people are like, what's going on? Is this a movement? I'm like, no, you need to be mad at the industry that's kept these voices out for so long because they know they're going to win all the awards, right? So that's for me is it's telling, you know, is once you open up and you let really creative, talented people in, you know, they know it's going to sweep. And so that is uh, something I wanted to, you know, to share and add <laughs> to that. So. Uh, absolutely, and and your your drive and passion are so palpable. Uh, someone is asking, how do you manage to do all this? You have you have thriving careers in multiple fields, uh, uh, even multiple kinds of writing, but also the photography and the journalism and the business. And how, you know, how do you balance everything? Well, um, I I recently found a word this year called multipotentialite, that there are people that just thrive on different creative things. And I always say that the worst thing you can do is compare yourself to a multipotentialite because they are doing different things and it frustrates you. But, <laughs> but you know, I mean, I have a great support system. You know, I'm married, I have kids, you know, you know, and for me, it's just following where my brain wants to go creatively. You know, and and so I don't know how to explain it, you know, besides, you know, having a supportive network behind me and then being able to gratefully, you know, do what I love. And it's taking years to get here, over 20 years. So it's not something that happened, you know, overnight. It's 
working at building at staying true to my voice and then creating my portfolio of ideas. So wonderful. Well, we're glad you did. And those are inspiring words to end on. I want to thank you both so much for letting us celebrate this book with you. And I want to thank all our viewers out there as we close. I want to remind you that we have some other great festival events coming up. And I want to thank our media sponsors here, Minneapolis St. Paul Magazine, Minnesota Public Radio, the Star Tribune, and Twin Cities Public Television, as well as, again, the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council and the Minnesota State Arts Board. Thanks most especially to each and every one of you for watching tonight. And thanks again to these wonderful authors. Good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Disha. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Lola. Thank you.